What's up? Welcome to the Confluence VC podcast. This podcast is meant to give you a personal glimpse into the next era of investors and operators. This week we had on Corey Walters with Here. Here lets anybody invest in vacation rentals like stocks. They handle all the administrative works and investors just earn passive income from it. We love this company, currently syndicating a small allocation in their upcoming round. And if you want to view that memo and participate in back that syndicate, you can do that just by following the link in the description below. In this talk, we cover educating for selling, the process of fractionalizing hard assets, and solving bottlenecks as you scale. Yo, everyone, welcome to the Confluence VC podcast. It's a pleasure to have you all. Today, we have someone who's given us the honor of being their inaugural podcast. And uh, we are very, very bullish on this category of companies. Uh, so we might just have breaking ground and done like the old school Kanye MTV breaks the artist thing. That was like famous <laughs> for, for breaking Kanye's career. I think we might be doing that for Corey today, even though this isn't his first time around the block. But uh, yo, welcome, Corey. You want to maybe tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, the amazing company you've just launched, Here.co? Hello, hello. Great to meet you, Tyler. I'm the founder and CEO at Here. We just launched about a week ago, so we're very excited to be talking with you today. Great timing. I'm should pausing because probably... you got to give us more. I should that. go into, yeah. Who are you, I wanted to be brief. I wanted yeah. to be brief, and then I was waiting for something else. Yeah, yeah, I, perfect. Said, yeah. I, said, I didn't say give us the elevator one. Yeah, line, I, know, I know, I know, on, I know, I know. Who yeah, are you? Where are you from? Two truths and a lie, favorite casserole <laughs> flavor. <laughs> Come on, bro. Yeah, yeah. So here turns vacation rentals um, into stocks that you can trade. That's our big kind of like elevator pitch, short and sweet. That's the short response. But the long answer is we work with the SEC to securitize and fractionalize assets in this, guy, this way by way of vacation rentals so that the average investor, retail investors, people that invest in Robinhood, people that invest in stocks, can get access to generally probably the most inaccessible or one of the most inaccessible real estate um, asset classes in the United States, which are vacation rentals. Feel that. It's awesome. And we're going to get into some of the, the broad line numbers of the, the area as well. Maybe even some of the barriers of entries. But before that, man, you are an elusive cat. I said, tell us about yourself as well, man. That was the first <laughs> thing I said. Who are you? Who's the magic behind the math? Yeah. So I've been building companies since I was about 15 years old. Before I could drive a car, I started my first business. I used to screen print t-shirts with a couple co-founder friends of mine. Shout out Ryan Adair. Shout out Tyler Murray. We created this surfwear lifestyle brand called Airit. We screen printed the shirts. We sold them out of the trunk of my car in high school. I'm pretty sure that venture lasted maybe six months or until we sold all the t-shirts. And then I think we split up the money and partied the entire summer. So that was <laughs> the initial foray into business. And uh, since then, it's been quite the journey. You know, here is uh, my second technology startup before here. I started a company called Homeworthy in New York City back in 2017. I had a co-founder at the time and we had a really interesting thesis we felt like people living in small town America were underserved and the tools and technology at their disposal to sell a house. So this is still pretty true to this day. You pull up a real estate listing in you know, rural America and the photos kind of look janky. They look like they're taken with somebody's you know, cell phone from like 10 years ago. They slap a yard sign in the yard and they charge a six or 7% commission. And we thought, huh, what if we brought like big city tools and technology to small town America? So like drone aerials, 3D scans, video walkthroughs. So if we brought those services to homeowners looking to sell their home in these small towns, could we sell their homes faster and for more money than their neighbors? So we picked the Pacific Northwest for our first market back in 2019. We launched in Vancouver, Washington, which is very close to Portland, Oregon, and Battleground, Washington. And over the course of about a year, we grew that that venture from two small towns in our service market to about 900 small towns and cities across the entire Pacific Northwest. So if you lived anywhere in the state of Washington or the state of Oregon, we could help you sell your house. And for the fraction of a cost of a traditional agent, home really charged around a 1% real estate commission. Fast forward, you know, 10 months into or barely even a year into home of these existence, and it's March 2020. 
you know, uh, world gets turned upside down. Everything's wild. The world's, you know, going crazy. COVID comes here to America. And um, Homeworthy was actually having its moment. So we actually built an entire, entirely remote way to sell a house in a time where people were very afraid to meet really anybody in person. And uh, we had this great attraction, the charts up and to the right, 300% month over month growth. My team's high-fiving. We're stoked. But with great growth comes great burn. So we went into March of 2020 with, I don't know, about 100 days worth of runway. And um, we came out of March 2020 with less than 30. So we reached out to our investors and said, hey, you know, this thing's growing like crazy. Let's keep throwing coals in the fire. Let's raise a bridge before we go out and raise a seed this summer. And it was probably the third week of March was probably the worst week in the history of venture capital up until this point or <laughs> dot com bubble to try and raise a bridge round for a startup that was pre-seed. And one by one, we kept hearing, you know, just make it to the summer. There's no checks coming across the table. And uh, we didn't have the summer to make it. So first week of April, I make the tough decision. Uh, I lay off my entire team at the time. There was almost 12 of us and um, including myself and myself and my family packed up our U-Haul and moved down to Florida to cockroach up and try and survive the summer. And, And that's what we did. So we went down to Merida in Florida, which is my hometown and tried to survive the summer, sold through all the homes that we'd signed up during COVID. And at the end of the summer, we tried to re-raise for Homeworthy to kind of kick the lights back on, rehire the team that we laid off. And we just couldn't clear market. We didn't have the traction. We didn't have the chart. I was pretty depressed and just didn't have that same kind of sparkle that we had kind of pre-COVID. After a couple of months of toiling and really struggling to clear market with investors, we decided to wind Homeworthy down. And what was to my surprise was the amount of investors that we spoke to that said, well, what's next? What's the next project? And and what, what are you working on next? And at the time, I was, that was not what I was thinking about at all. I was more like yeah. thinking about survival. And um, it actually gave me a lot of confidence. So I started to pick up books and articles and you know, everything I could get my hands on. And um, around this time, I think Airbnb was getting ready to go public. And there was this great research report on the Airbnb IPO from a company called Granvy Research. And uh, in that research report, it said by 2025, 75% of all travel and leisure spend in North America is going to be made by millennials or younger. And that metric stung me like a bee. I mean, it sent me down the rabbit hole of all rabbit holes of trying to look for answers as to what does this mean and who does this impact? Basically, it's saying like millennial demand is here to stay and it's going to drive the travel and leisure industry of the next decade. And that was the kind of small glimmer of year. And obviously it's been about a year and a half since then, since, since that, you know, that moment. But I would say that was the initial light bulb moment of there's something going on here in travel and more or less in where millennials choose to stay when they do travel. Dude, you're spot on. And you hit on the fractional investing trend. And something that I want to give you credit for is the bounce back. Two things. One, I have a mentor and friend who used to run the family office of the folks who own Forever 21. And now he's like a huge big shot at China Renaissance. And he would say that a person is not measured by their heights, but they're measured by their ability to bounce. Meaning once you fall down, is your bounce strong enough to get you past the height at which you fell? And it seems like you've done that quickly. Like in half the time (laughs) that your last company was around, you've raised raised 4X the money. And that's one thing. Second thing is a lot of investors don't want to invest in in someone who's not failed before. So it explains why for you and hopefully some other folks who you are inspiring here, if you do fail, it's okay. And it actually might yield you more than you assumed. Yeah. I don't think I gave, I don't think I gave enough time to, to fully mourn the loss of Homeworthy. I think that was a help with founders. It goes one way or another. And, you know, sometimes it's really, really hard or you're able to get back up. And I think I got really lucky because of the timing, you know, and then, I mean, you know how it goes, you know, you you get bit by this idea and then the idea becomes the seed of a disease that grows inside you. That just like, and it's, it either come, it's coming out of you in one way, shape or form, you know, and I'm fortunate because the timing of that, sometimes it takes years, you know, it was five years before I started home (laughs) where there was a gap of nothing. So it was, it's how it goes. Dude, I'm going to, I'm going to at this point get corny and give you another one. <laughs> so uh, Bill Gross of Idea Lab, he's done like 100, 200 companies at this point out of his startup studio, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. He said that the number one thing about companies, it's not financing, it's not business plan, it's not team. These things are all pivotal, but the biggest thing is timing. So 
don't just write off home where you're at. You might crush it at here.co. Yeah. Make a exit or not. And then the perfect time comes up and you have the infrastructure and you're ahead of it for homeworthy. So like keep it in your pocket, bro. I don't know. Here consumes about 90 hours of my hundred hours in a week at the moment. <laughs> Barely got time to shower at, at the right now, but yeah, you know, yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting, uh, interesting theory. I really believe in, in timing and waves. And I think like we're seeing a once in a lifetime wave of the millennial, whatever you want to call it, generation class, et cetera really rising up and driving the economy really over the next decade. True. Let's dive a little bit further into that. What problem are you solving for the millennials? And what trends are you also playing on? Let's dive into the yeah, whole let's... rabbit hole that you described. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, we'll start hitting some of these cookie crumbs that I found. So when, it, when I popped out the other side of going down this kind of rabbit hole that that metric from Grammy Research led me down, came out with an interesting thesis with like, which is like, there isn't really... It's, it's no secret that when millennials travel or when young people travel, they prefer alternative accommodations when they travel to destinations. So these are things um, like cabins and yurts and glamping. And the idea is like the opposite of hotels in, in many cases. And um, in reality, there really isn't a consolidated supply of that type of inventory. So I don't know how often you stay in an Airbnb, but there's a good chance when you, last time you stayed in one, it's owned by an independent operator. It's owned by, you know, some guy that's like their second house or some girl at their second house, or maybe there's a property manager that, that manages, for, manages it for them, but there really isn't a consolidated portfolio or brand in that space that owns and operates these vacation rentals. So I guess that's the first problem is it's largely fragmented specifically around like, I don't know if you've ever checked into an Airbnb, but you get there and like the locks don't work or there's, there's still plates in the sink or it's kind of highly unpredictable. The reviews are a great signal, but it's still tough to understand what's coming out the other side when I, book, when I hit book on this $1,200 you know, for four nights stay in Joshua Tree, for example. So that was the first opportunity of like, okay, well, let's build you know, a reliable brand in this space and build a portfolio. The second is this, idea around real estate investing in general. So I don't know about you, but the last time I tried to be a real estate investor, or I tried to you know, up, up, apply for a loan. I think it was 20% down. I had to have a 670 credit score. And at the time, I think based on the type of property I was going to, uh, I had to have like some kind of you know, 80 to $100,000 a year in income. And that's changed even in the last two years in regards to what that down payment is for that $300,000 house. Now that $300,000 house is $450,000 and, and I don't have to put $60,000 down. Now I have to put $100,000 down just to call myself a real estate investor. So we don't think that problem is going away. And specifically, there, there is no secret that cap rates are shrinking. And what a cap rate is, essentially, it's like if I put in a dollar, how much, what percentage of that do I get back at the end of the year? 1%, 2%, 5%, uh, you know, 10%, whatever that might be. And that's continuing to happen. Home values are increasing, but rents aren't increasing at the same rate that home values are. So you're seeing significant cap rate compression. So the obvious answer that we, or obvious question we get all the time, which is like, well, why don't you do long-term rentals? Like, well, what's the point of short-term rentals? Why don't just make it easy for anybody to be a real estate investor in long-term rentals? Well, the long answer is there's probably, you know, historically going to be continued compression in, um, in cap rates there and a reduction returns in, in that asset class. So, you know, from an investment standpoint, short-term rentals in a way are almost like a hedge against that. They're largely specifically the properties we're targeting are in, you know, destination markets, which are markets that, you know, there aren't, there isn't a lot of supply. There isn't these massive subdivisions of homes, you know, let's say Joshua Tree or Big Bear or the Hudson Valley, their supply almost like restrictions. So you're largely, you know, siloed away from these like boom and bust cycles that you see in like the Atlantas or the Austins or where they, they build a lot. And then almost like the bottom falls out when there's a real estate market collapse. So we think that's a really interesting opportunity that short-term rentals present just as an asset class. And it does feed into the fact that the primary user of this asset class are millennials, specifically in these destination markets. Like I was, you know, speaking about the Joshua trees and the Brecken Ridges and things like that. Makes a ton of sense. So if I'm looking to activate as one of your target seg segment members, what does this start to look like for me? By the way, I just got off the wait list and I'm stoked to do so. What do you mean? So as far as like, what's our ideal customer or? Well, yeah, we could actually go into that for sure. But I'm thinking these trends are hitting. Yeah. You now enabling me to put a ton less down. Yeah. Go against this trend. 
how does that actually look to me? Like I'm investing in all these things yes. and now I'm getting access here. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. So the, the biggest, I guess, difference to, you know, you investing individually, buying your own property and managing yourself or using a third-party property manager is we remove every possible barrier that exists. So one of them is there's no credit check. So we don't check your credit score. There's no hard pull. You don't have to worry about us checking to see if you paid your last credit card bill, your last utility bill. So that's the first one, no credit checks. The second, there's no debt to income ratio. So you're not getting put on like a loan. We're not underwriting you to make sure that you know, make, you say what you, you make, and then there's W2 involved and we got it. There's no cross-checking there. It is truthfully like in, investing in stock where it's as simple as I decide I want to invest in one, two, three Apple street. And I'd like to invest $100. It is, you know, tap, tap sign. Very, very fast. Very, very seamless. And that's a big departure from how I grew up with what it was like real estate investing, which was highly hands-on, highly involved high risk specifically around being tied up on you know your credit scores attached to a loan or just the time that it takes to even if you aren't the property manager you're still managing to make sure that you're paying your property insurance and your taxes and this utility bill and making sure this credit card's attached to you know this fee yeah i would say that's the the primary difference in what it's like compared to you know, traditional real estate investing and the added benefit is the reduced friction on the capital side if you normally invest ten thousand dollars or a hundred thousand or however much you invest in real estate traditionally or in just invest in general, you can start much smaller with here. You can test the product. You know, hundred dollar investments usually generally what somebody reserves for like a Robin Hood or something like that. So you're able to test to see, oh, okay, this is interesting. You know, you're not having to overcommit and invest tens of thousands of dollars just to test, you know, the product. Dude, I love that. I mean, it seems pretty obvious for people to use it. How have you all gone about educating your target segments and building demand prior to launching? seems like the wait list is kind of long. People are asking me if I'm off it or not. Yeah. You know, that's one of the things we've been fortunate about. I think at the time of this taping, I think leading up to launch, we had around 20,000 people on the wait list. And at, at the early set, we initially were targeting higher net worth individuals that worked at basically the top 500 companies in the United States. So these are engineers, product managers, individuals like that, that work at you know Google and Facebook and Microsoft. And over time, we've actually changed that as our go-to-market strategy of who we are looking to acquire for customers. And that's transitioned more towards you know the server at Applebee's or the Uber driver or just the average person that is so removed from real estate investing and real estate investing is so unattainable that this is incredibly useful and appealing to them. And that's where we started to really see significant traction on signups, significant reduction in customer acquisition costs, and significant engagement post signup. And what, what we mean by that when we say engagement post signup is generally when somebody joins the wait list, they get an email from me that says, Hey, my name's Corey, you know, just reaching out, would love to help answer any questions you have about here. And, you know, just would love to talk shop. You would think not many people would respond to that. It kind of seems like a you know cold email that's like kind of generic. Some dude named Corey's reaching out to you from some service you signed up with. But we were getting, I think at the peak of this, I had to shut it off because it started to get so extreme. But we were getting like one or five, one out of four or one out of five investors that we reached out with that cold email after they signed up with responded and wanted to talk with me. So we learned, okay, this is where, because when you're in this like Goldilocks zone of you're not launched, you're there's no way of telling if anybody cares you have to look for these other signals. So that was a signal we were like, we're onto something here because this is the audience that is the most engaged, most excited, most eager to join. And then over the last, I would say 90 days, I started to get like crazy hate mail from investors on the wait list of like, I've been on the wait list for four months. Like what's going on? It started to get out of control. And I started to feel the pressure myself to launch. I was like, we got to launch this thing as soon as possible. Dude, that's an incredible position to be in. I mean, yeah, but you feel bad. like I was just preparing to throw a brick through your window before I got off the wait list. <laughs> so. <laughs> you feel bad. And I started to get people that would reach out to me on LinkedIn and like find through these other channels to reach out. And it's hard because this is a very highly regulated, you know, uh, asset that we're bringing to sp this space, which is this reggae plus. And I don't know how much you want me to speak on that, but essentially it's an SEC. Can you give us, yeah. Give us like the yeah. one minute overview. Yeah. So the Reg A plus, if you're familiar with like a Reg D, Reg D is like accredited investors only, very low restrictions. Most, most venture funds are raised under Reg D. Most platforms online that are like crowdfunding or somewhat fractional are mostly Reg D or accredited only. 
within the last couple of years, the SEC rolled out this instrument called the Reg A Plus. It essentially allows you to raise capital and, fr and fractionalize really any asset of value for any investor class. So you could be uh, accredited, non-accredited, you could be an international investor. And that enables the investors in these different accreditation classes to invest. So it really anybody of any walk of life, any net worth can invest in a Reg A Plus offering. And that is a big deal because historically higher risk assets, fractional assets, things like that have been reserved for the ultra wealthy. And the SEC, you know, allows platforms like ours to raise about 75 million a year from the Reg A Plus instrument, which is, is which is incredible. And it's actually been increasing year over year. So that's the high and tight on, on how the Reg A Plus works, but it's easy to talk about over coffee, but the actual build out of it and to get approved takes an incredible amount of time and an incredible amount of energy and money. So it took us about a year from start to finish to get SEC approval, which we received about two weeks ago, about a week before launch. That's gorgeous. Yeah, I'm actually like, it's funny. I'm here in Mexico right now. Oh, nice. I just talked to my neighbor about how they just got this place. And I'm like, bro, all this stuff had to go down. Even with me being someone who's effectively in a position to be able to purchase, like I cannot. And with these new regulatory shifts, I'm like, man, from vacation rentals with you all to like your homies at Fran Shares to yeah. some of the farming people. I'm Shout like, out dude, I might as well, yeah, I might as well just like do this, you know? <laughs> like, well, think, think about it this way, you know, DoorDash is a great example. I could call the Chinese restaurant down the street. I could drive over there. I could pick it up myself and pay no fees, you know, but it's high friction. I got to get up my car. I got to drive my car there. Got to wait in line. I got to pick up the bag. I got to drive back. Or I could go on DoorDash. I can order the same exact food and then I can turn on another episode of Netflix and not have to leave my house. And I think we're slowly heading towards a convenience economy here in the United States. And I think if you can find a way to create alignment where there isn't the return disparity that you see that, that, that would exist you know, in, in other asset classes, then I think it's a really interesting proposition. So I think like what you're saying is, yeah, I could go through all these hurdles or I could just invest on you know, whatever X platform we think that's a trend that's going to continue, you know, and we're big fans of anybody in the fractional space includes uh, Franchise, Vent, uh, Farm Together, Acre Trade. I mean, there's a bunch of great, great, great platforms and different asset classes. Masterworks is another example. Most staff, dude. Can you break down how the, the back end of all these things works or at least how you all's works? Yeah, yeah. So I can go down two paths. I can talk about how the, the tech side works. Or I can go into kind of acquisitions, property how we identify a property, which path, which, which, which side would you rather hear? How about one minute or two minutes on like okay. tech stuff? And then like, we go into like real detail about like the magic. Sounds good. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. So essentially we're creating shares. So essentially we're creating almost like a managed, think about it as like a managed stock market. So in here's case, we are creating our own stock market where IPOs are happening. So the, the reggae plus essentially it's treated like an IPO. So each property is its own IPO. And you're creating essentially this initial profit offering, which then shares are broken up with uh, on an offering and then investors are then investing in that offering. And so we essentially create an IPO for each offering. In here's case, investors are investing in individual properties. So it's an individual offering. Each property is broken up into shares. It, it, it ranges from you know a dollar up to ten dollars a share, and you know a property has a market cap just like a publicly traded company would. And then we manage yeah you know, the cap table for each for each offering, just like the stock market. So here's interesting because we're essentially building this you know individualized asset class managed marketplace, which is a big pill to swallow or a big big word jumble to small swallow, but essentially. Um, that's the tech stack we have to build out. So think about if like, you know, Robinhood and the New York Stock Exchange combined, and then, oh, by the way, they also create the stocks that they place on the platform. That's the-, yeah, the like lift Effectively that like drive wealth, if any of our investors here, like if you know that, like software plus all these things, like a cool little salad. Yeah, we actually then, partnered with drive wealth. So that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, that was a, a portfolio company of mine when I was at Point Seventy Two Ventures. Oh, nice. Perfect. Yep. 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 So we're partnered with Drive Wealth and, and, you know, they help, they help enable a lot of those mechanisms. Nice. Nice. Well, okay. Now let's go through the here process. Yeah. Great, great, uh, great transition. So essentially we, 
identify markets at the macro level that we want to be in. There's two paths when we first started working on this, this project that we were presented with, which was, you know, do we focus on higher yielding markets that are maybe a bit more risky? These are big cities in America, but not really vacation destinations. It could be like a Milwaukee or an Indianapolis or an Atlanta where people are sometimes traveling to them, but they're not really vacation markets, so to speak. Or the second path, which is, which is we call destination markets. These are the you know, Joshua trees of the world or the, the Poconos or the Smoky Mountains or the Rocky Mountains, you know, places near big national parks where properties return, strong returns, but they're in more desirable locations, more stable long-term from a, you know, the idea is like people have been traveling to the Poconos for decades. They're probably going to be traveling there for the, for the foreseeable future. The Florida Keys is another example. So on the macro level, we're, we're focused on essentially like the top 50 to 100 vacation destinations here in the United States. And then on, on the property level, we dive a bit deeper into what is the best property for sale in this market? So what is the kind of most desirable property in Joshua Tree that's available for sale right now? If that's where we're looking to acquire a property. And then we run, you know, underwriting process on what we think the cap rate will look like, what we think a levered return will look like. Will it pass inspection? Does it have furniture in place? That's another big thing. We're in a really tough supply chain time here in the United States. And if you buy a property that's totally vacant, there's a good chance it's going to take you eight weeks to get a couch. And we don't have eight weeks to wait. So currently we're looking for properties that are already furnished so that we can turn them on quickly and offer them to investors on the platform as quickly as possible. So those are a couple of factors we we look at. We look at other market indicators. You know, what are the trend lines on average daily rate for a specific market, average occupancy rate, regulation is very important. I don't know how, how much you track vacation rentals as a thing, but it's highly contentious here in the United States of if the city that you live in allows vacation rentals or doesn't allow vacation rentals. So that's a really important thing that we look at because obviously we don't want to be you know, creating these IPOs for these properties that are in markets where they're illegal six months into us owning them. Oh man, I just realized I was muted. No, totally. That makes a lot of sense. I was going to ask, like I told you, I'm here in Mexico. Will you all be doing vacation rentals here? Because I'd love to just have something everywhere. And then another question is just randomly, I know that this isn't part of the thesis or like execution today, but can I stay at these places <laughs> like if I invest? Yeah. So I answer the first question. I have to be careful about how I have to answer the first question, but this is the political response for me or the like uh, PR approved response, <laughs> which is, you know, we're focused on launching the most desirable properties in the most enchanting destinations on planet earth. So today we're focused on the United States. However, we have plans to launch the best properties that exist in the most enchanting destinations on planet earth. So there's definitely some significant interest there. The next question on if you can stay in the properties that you are invested in. Uh, yes, you can. Every property that you invest in, you know, there's an available Airbnb link where you can go and stay in the property. Now here's the conundrum. And actually you're in VC and you know, you understand finance. How do you give free nights to 900 investors on an offering? That's the question we ask ourselves when we think about free nights or benefits or travel and leisure benefits for here. The other tough question and actually the tough problem we're trying to figure out is when you invest in it with a 401k or some type of retirement account, you wouldn't be able to actually make that investment with your 401k retirement account if you actually are able to utilize the property with the funds that you invested with. So that presents an interesting question. Is, is, and, and we've started to work on ways around it, but you don't want to do that either. You, know, you don't want to not allow somebody to invest in a 401k because they're getting free nights. So it presents an interesting problem. However, you're totally open to, to book nights in any property, you know, in the here network and even individual properties that you're invested in. So I actually have a few ideas on the IRA or like uh, retirement account front. You probably should check out companies like Auto IRA, which are letting people invest in crypto do those things. Yeah, we're working on a partnership with them. Oh, yeah. Very close to the, the team over there. Very dope. I think my buddy Chase might be there now. Uh, that was actually one of the flags they brought up when we were, when we initially were chatting with them is they asked, can people stay here for free? And we were still uncertain, you know, this is months and months and months ago. We have much clearer idea now, but 
And they're like, so, yeah, they can't invest with Alta if that were the case. So that became an interesting, like, oh, that was the first time we realized that there was an issue there or there was some kind of discussion that would need to be had around that. I actually don't think you need to give them to people for free. So like when I look at property investments, there is a vacancy period on average, right? Like every month you have an average vacancy. Yep. What you could do is make it to where these properties have a lower vacancy rate by saying whatever amount of days on average are vacant based on like up to call it 72 hours ahead of a booking, you let people within the network book those at like a slight discount. Tyler, are you and, looking for a job? <laughs> uh, I would love to be. I mean, dude, I'm, I'm like, I've, I've worked at some really serious fintech companies and now I like am a founder myself in addition to being an yeah. investor, but like not companies, but funds. I would yeah. love to come on as like a, a advisor or a friend of you all. Um, maybe, think- maybe, maybe I'll come work join you all. Who knows? As now I'm building Wait. my own stuff, but let's talk. <laughs> We, we think about the same thing. So we thought about building kind of an internal hotel tonight almost where we know that the third week in March is always going to be blank because there's nothing going on. There's, it, it's not a holiday weekend. It's a ski town, but there's no skiing available because it's, you know, it's, it's almost springtime or whatever that might be. And there's a, you know, massive opportunity to backfill, you know, most properties, it's almost impossible to get hundred percent occupancy. There is an opportunity to fill that that back 15 or 20% of vacancy with investors in the network. So we've definitely, that was actually an idea that came from an investor on the wait list, but there's some other ideas we thought about around travel and leisure benefits that don't involve free nights, but are more like maybe advanced booking dates so that, you know, if it's a hot market, it's a, it's a hot destination and it's generally booked six, seven months in advance, maybe members on the platform get 30 to 60 days in advance notice on those dates. Yeah, so we think there's a big it doesn't opportunity matter. there. It doesn't. Dude, you no. want to hear something else that's well, crazy? Yeah. Another crazy idea. Everyone who books in a property on here, yeah, 5% of that goes back into a portfolio of them. So like you get a piece of that. Let's say I spend $1,000. I get $10 worth of fractional shares. It's very interesting. Very interesting you say now that. Now people yeah. are always incentivized to come yeah, for, we, for their friends, et cetera. You're getting into the VC pitch now. So this is usually about 25 minutes into my pre-seed round pitch where we talk about flywheel and this very unique network effect that is very specific to here where you have guests that you have the holy grail of marketing data on, by the way. You know, if you stay in a vacation rental, they have your driver's license, they have your phone number, they have your email address, they have your mailing address, they have everything. So you have the holy grail of marketing data on your guests. So you have guests becoming members. And then you have members becoming guests. And it's a really incredible flywheel when you have hundreds or thousands of properties that you have anywhere from 30 to 40 guests staying in each property per year. There's a very interesting opportunity there. We think around building a really, really great customer acquisition moat. If that's the case, then what you actually could do is incentivize people to build their portfolio as well by saying, hey, we will give you insight into when things will be open, like call it 30 days earlier, or 48 hours earlier or something like that. Right. But more importantly, let's just assume that they don't get anything for free or for any discount, that cash back thing or like fractional share back thing. If you're not someone who has over, call it a thousand dollars in in portfolio value, you get like one, like 1% back. If if you have a thousand, then it's 2%. If you have 10,000 in your portfolio, you get 5X back or 5% back points or fractional shares. Really smart. Then like you start to see people who are frequent travelers effectively have a hundred thousand dollar account getting like nine percent back every time they do it in their in their uh book right that's you, that's sticky bro <laughs> like you want to hear some that. you, you want to hear something interesting our head of operations posted this in the slack channel today which was we had a guest on airbnb reach out and send a message to us our host account they said hey i just invested really excited to come stay in the property in the fall or whenever they booked and we couldn't believe it because the listing, the Airbnb listing actually isn't public on the offering page. It gets pushed. It gets pushed live after the offering's already been completed or it gets shown or appears after the offering's been completed. So we had somebody that went and looked for the property, booked the stay, and kind of plays into what you're saying, which is like this idea around investing in travel and building a community around investing in travel. And what a better way to invest in travel than through vacation rentals and specifically these incredibly desirable locations across the planet. 
Dude, it could be brilliant for you to just go to Airbnb owners and say, hey, man, would you like to sell 30% of your property or something like that into this platform and then start doing kickbacks to people who stay at your place? You're As tugging a- on the right strings, Tyler. Dude, we, let's have some strategy conversations. Also, <laughs> also, we need to do a syndicate for Confluence. Obviously. Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah, that would be cool. Get like a, yeah, a we'd love that. Investors in. <laughs> like who yeah, that'd be cool. It's good timing. We're getting ready to kick off our seeds. So that's uh, it's great timing. Yeah, maybe even my own funds. The family offices I invest in might be interested. So I'm fascinated by this. This is cooler than I, when I read it, I thought obviously the trends are on point and I need to figure out how to do this myself. Now sure. my investor and builder hats coming in and you got a lot of runway, dude. Oh, thank you. Yeah, really interesting uh, opportunities on the road yeah. for sure. Definitely. Okay. What, what questions did we have last? Like we kind of got a little bit off. Okay. <laughs> what bottleneck are you feeling? Answer that in a specific way though. What I would love is for you to answer it in a way, one in which you're just being honest, mm-hmm. but two in which our community can maybe help you or anyone who's hearing this can maybe help you. It's a great question. Well, it's a few bottlenecks. So I'm trying to figure out what is the, the, the highest right now. Our big challenge is competing for deals. So we're buying properties all over the country. We're launching properties all over the country in new markets, you know, every month. And where we face one of the biggest challenges is we find a deal that makes sense that we want to buy, that we, you know, the feeling when you find a home that you want to rent or buy or live in, and it's like, man, you fall in love with it. We find fall in love with these deals. And, you know, it's such a competitive real estate market. It's not just residential real estate or traditional real estate that that's seeing this vacation rentals are incredibly competitive right now too, as an asset class to compete in. So that's a big bottleneck that we're trying to figure out. We're having to expand our funnel and look a lot wider in regards to the properties we're looking at and really looking at a bunch of different markets. So I guess that was the, the first that we're, we're building for, or the bottleneck that we're building for getting around. And we have some ideas there. I guess the second bottleneck really is around trust and building trust. One of the unfortunate handcuffs we see with the rag is we're not able to talk about the, the, the future. So we can't speak about preferred returns or IRR or projected returns or things like that. We're basically barred from talking about the future. And that's been incredibly frustrating. We can't create calculators. We can't create the tools that help people make decisions for themselves. So how do you build trust when you can't do that? And that's another huge bottleneck or huge challenge that we're trying to figure out. And I think the short-term answer is education. We're thinking pretty deeply around, we're the only way on planet earth to be able to own shares or invest in vacation rentals fractionally on an individual property basis. And that's a great gift, but it's also a great challenge because how do you educate investors that have never even invested in this asset class before? And, and then also after you educate them, how do you get them to trust you to make an investment? So I would say those are the two that you know keep me up at night. Those are the two problems that we're working the hardest on over the next couple of months. Everyone, please help. Number one. <laughs> two, last week or the week before last, we had our buddy, was it Jared or Justin? Yeah, one of our buddies from Built First, who effectively runs like a, a marketplace for partnerships and distribution for different tools. But like the, the future vision of that, once you release it, is just incredible about like what you can do with the pipes of creating a marketplace and set of tools for automated partnerships in distro. Right. But the, be, the behind the scenes or the driving ethos of that is partnerships provide a few things. They provide lower CAC, but more importantly, they provide immediate trust. So while you say education is the fastest way, I partially agree. But I would recommend to you is to find people in the relevant space uh, or who have significant trust with your target segments and partner with them. Because simply by them presenting it to their users, you shortcut CAC. And on top of that, you gain full trust that person or organization has built over the decades, or I guess now startup lands, it could be months. Like they might've started six months ago and have 10 million users. Who knows? Sure. Yeah. But, <laughs> yeah. That's how it goes. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, definitely do that. And Appreciate like, the advice. A list of 10 or 15 companies that, that might make a fit for you. Yeah. We're definitely thinking about that a lot. I mean, we talked briefly about Alto, but there are others out there that come to mind, but that's the big one. I mean, that's the big beast to be slayed and fractional is trust. That's how you get somebody to make the second and the third and the fourth investment, the fifth investment. And that's also how you get them to tell their friends. 
Exactly. Another thing I might do is I might quit everything I'm doing, create, like go raise a ton of like PE money yeah. or something like that. And then roll up all of your, you fractional guys, man, the company. there's going to be, uh, there's going to be consolidation, but there might also might not be, I mean, you know, you look at masterworks, you all are huge individuals. Yeah. You, so yeah. Huge. It's such a weird, I'm just pissed I didn't start one first. That's what I'm Yeah. About. I mean, it's like an Amazon roll-up company, but for these fractional platforms, you know, um, but I mean, you look at Masterworks and it's like the first, if you're the first to market, Franchier is another, is another great example. If you're the first to market and you do it well and you get big somewhat fast, Masterworks has had an uncontested monopoly on artwork, specifically fractional uh, investing in artwork for almost four or five years now. It's because fractional and, inherently makes you a marketplace and you get the marketplace network. Yeah. Yeah. And capital is very sticky on these marketplaces as well. I'm friendly with the team over at Otis and that's what we've heard there as well. So we, we think there's, we think that's a in, it, significant advantage to being a first to market. And then also what does it mean when you build a managed stock market, essentially? It's like, well, what does this mean? Well, if you look at the other players that are a couple years older than us, if you build it right, you kind of end up with this like uncontested monopoly in your space. And then, you know, what does it mean being the second masterworks competitor or third? It's just hard because then you have to fight the same trust barriers that they broke down two years ago, three years ago. And you got to find a way to peel the capital off the platform or fight with them on customer acquisition. So we see that as an interesting blueprint for here around how we think about customer acquisition, how we think about building modes. And basically why we're hyper-focused on vacation rentals as an asset class. Dude, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Yeah, the world's a lot different now. Access is there. Um, one question, this is a bit off script that, that yeah. I'm curious about is like, how do you get to, like, how do you imagine getting to the volume of yeah. GMV on your marketplace that you need to make this huge? Like, yeah. it's kind of like the cold start chicken and egg problem. Oh, certainly. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah, let's say really big. What's the big number in startups? Like $100 million a year in revenue is like the big one. That's like the big, like, okay. Yeah. And then you can go like when IPO, I was looking right? at Acre Theater, I was like, how do they get there? Are how they- do they get to, yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, no, I know what you mean. We talk about this internally all the time. For us, our $100 million mark, like what that means for us as a company, based on our strike zone of the type of properties we acquire and the value of those properties, for us, it's around 70 to 80 properties a month new properties on the platform to reach a hundred million a year in revenue. So it's not unattainable. I mean, it's right there. Um, and if we went up market, it would be less properties. And if we went down market, Are we talking more. commercial, what you saying, man, <laughs> resorts. Yeah. Well, you, you want to be you buying know, resorts on this thing. I know some big families you know, in, uh, what's, in Latin America who yeah. own a ton of resorts. You know, what's funny is I, I have a friend of mine. He's a YouTuber. His name's Rob. Uh, he goes by Rob Belt and, He's like the number one YouTuber in vacation rentals and he's got a great audience. And he, um, he I don't want, I don't know if I can disclose this or not. We'll see, but he's buying a couple million dollar property in, in Arizona. And what's ironic is that as you go up market, the returns don't deteriorate. So what's interesting is you buy a $3 million property That's in the Sedona. Real estate, man. Yeah. So it's not necessarily a resort. It's like a $3 million, let's say seven bedroom home, eight bedroom home that sleeps 16. And it produces, you know, 20% of its value in booking revenue. And then you've got this incredible cash cow that's somewhat like a monument in that market. You know, it's like maybe one of the more expensive vacation homes there. So it's like, if I wanted to travel to Sedona and it were the one of the nicer ones, there's a good chance it's the one that I, it's in demand. Specifically, if I'm traveling with a group or I've got a higher net worth or whatever that might be. So there's some interesting stuff we're testing, which is like higher value homes, lower value homes. But I would say in like our strike zone right now, like for us, a hundred million a year is, you know, anywhere from 70, 80 homes a year. And that's based on our current revenue model. So if a revenue model changed, that could go up or down. Yeah, that's not, that's excluding you all having some sort of like secondary transaction flow, take rate and stuff like that. Yep. And a ton of other tools you can put on top of these. Yep, but, yep um, certainly. Yeah. All right. I've asked you enough. You get to ask me a question before we go into a rapid fire. What's the most interesting startup you've invested in the last hundred days? The last hundred days. Wow. It could be 120, but hundred days is nice and tight. It's like thir- three months. Let me think. So it can be over if it's over. No, 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 no. I'll, I'll answer it properly. But I'm actually going to say what I didn't invest in. Oh, that's even better. I like that one even better. Change my question. Yeah. Which one do you regret missing? 
in the last <laughs> six months. There's this company called Icon okay. that I didn't invest in. And they do 3D printed homes. So I said that because it's relevant to you. Sure. And it's dope, right? Like if you go to iconbuild.com, I believe is the website. They like have these 3D printers. They're the first ever to build a home that cleared all regulatory hurdles. Cool logo too. Yeah, it's hot. (laughs) And they have- I'm a logo guy. I like these logos. They've raised so much money. The valuation ran away from me because it's so hot. But at the same time, like it could change the world. It oh, I've is. seen that. I've seen them. I, it's the way that they print these. It's like a very unique, it's almost like a string method. Like it's one string all the way around and then they stack it. That's so cool. Yeah. You all should probably like at some point be in touch with them, but send the intro. like Let's generally, I don't know how the, how the founders feel about me after passing on the round. We'll see. Oh, it's but, so uh, <laughs> I should, the thing is, if I came in, it's the thing about it is to be very, very, very clear on this podcast. Yeah. Like it is not that the company isn't great is that I was too late to invest. It was just too sure. expensive. I was like, you know, so whatever. Yeah, um, they're building anyways, stuff on the moon. They're you building stuff on the moon. They're building stuff in whoever knows it, where military was, stuff. Great. It's just incredible. Here's the important like, question. Was the moon the, involved in the pitch deck when you passed? Yes. Dang. And you passed. And I got the in moon, my- You would have had me at the moon, man. At the moon, whatever the valuation is. Dude, God. if you knew if you knew what the valuation was. For <laughs> PM me the valuation after this. <laughs> yeah, I'll be yeah, yeah, bro. It's, it's one, it sounds like a, a pre-revenue fintech. How about this? How about this? Yeah. It's, it's similar to, if not worse, than a clubhouse valuation. Okay, all right. So like, just, But the yeah, real yeah, thing, okay. the difference is clubhouse is clubhouse and this is real. Either yeah, way, ridiculous point. valuations. Wow. Uh, <laughs> wow. So that's that. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Now, rapid fire, but okay. I will also give you one chance to ask the yes, audience sir. for any favor you want and or to talk about any investor type you want to reach out to you. Check out Vacation Rentals. Doesn't have to be it here. Doesn't have to be investing it here. Just do, do some research. You'd be surprised at the amount of people I talk to where they don't even know this is an investable asset class. It feels like a hobby, feels like, um, you know, fly by night or feels like it's a temporary trend. Check out Vacation Rentals because I, I do believe it's an asset class that's somewhat new. It's just now being taken seriously and it's largely here to stay. So, you know, we're all in. My team is all in on this. I'm all in on this. I'm a believer. I think this is going to be a multi-decade long trend of being one of the highest yielding asset classes in real estate. So that would be it. I mean, it'd be corny to, to, for me to ask everybody to sign up and, you know, invest the money on here. But you kind but, of uh, <laughs> Yeah, but you don't have to search here. I mean, we're not going to show up on, as number one on Google search if you search investing in vacation roles. I think we're like six or seven. Guys, but, this is how you know he's um, like, need to do it. Because if he wasn't, he'd be like, you know, go check out these four alternatives. He's like... You don't have to go to here.co. Just Google search it. And you're going to end up seeing it anyways. No, <laughs> I'm not going to uh, name anyone else. But here. <laughs> you could look at YouTube videos, things like that. But yeah, I mean, another example is you can go on AirDNA and like type in your home, the home that you live on an AirDNA and see what it would do in booking revenue. And that will give you an idea as far as like what's possible out there because they are more expensive to manage, but it's relative to the increase that you see in booking revenue versus a long-term tenant. I guess that's the ask. I'm not going to be corny and say, you know, sign up here. I'll Um, say, yo, everybody sign up for here.co. It's dope. You can make some money. And apparently you'll be able to get dibs on the property in some way. I don't know how yet. If you invest to be also be able to stand it. Cool. Send me a message. Send me a message. If you send me a message, that Tyler from Confluence sent you, uh, I'll send you here swag. So send me a message, Corey at here.co, C-O-R-E-Y at here, H-E-R-E dot C-O. I'll send you some here swag. Whether you invest or don't, whether you invest or don't invest. So that'll let me know that there's people listening to this. True. What kind of investors do you want? We got a thousand firms plus on here. So like we, all shapes and sizes. I mean, you know, we're not building this for accredited. We're not building this for anybody specific. You know, we're really trying to figure out who our audience is. We have these fantasies of who we think our audience is, but in reality, we're trying to figure out who it resonates with. There's some interesting metrics. I'm saying what VCs do you want? Oh, VCs. We have our hit list, but we were hit list, but. You ain't on it too bad. Well, no, it's not that. It's, that's not it. 
that's not it. We just have some very, you know, specific partners that, you know, we're, that we're hoping to work with. And it's an interesting time to be raising. It's weird. It feels like the world's upside down and not upside down at the same time. So, um, yeah. Oh, on the VC side, I don't know, Tyler. It's, it's interesting, uh, interesting question. If you're VC, reach out. I mean, that too. But if you're VC, you reach out. You don't get swag. It's only if you're interested in vacation rentals. <laughs> uh, <laughs> or, writing a check, or writing a check at a significant step up to the last valuation. Definitely get swag for sure. We're, we, we're big on, on swag. I, I send swag to, to everybody that's excited about the mission or you know that I, have, I build a relationship with it here. So that's, that's like our stocking mm. stuffer for everybody. So I just also like cool my, swag too. Our logo's cool. It looks cool on t-shirts. I just refreshed my my LinkedIn page, and the first thing that pops up is Mucker Capital announcing the seed raise of here. How cool is that? Pre-seed, two million bucks. It's pretty good. Yeah, um, yeah. very very excited. You Shout know. out Clay. It's just a little grounds. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. You know what's funny? You know I owe a lot to Mucker because they invested before we even had a name for this company, and I didn't even have a pitch deck. So I wouldn't they, be surprised if Clay was the one who like threw it on their radar. Keep it a buck. They, I was actually shout out Andrew Lung from DoorVest. He, he connected us and they've been with us ever since. They've been incredible partners, but yeah, we just announced a couple of days ago that pre-seed. So we're excited for that and excited to, to launch. Got it. Beautiful. Well, okay. Rapid fire. Cause we got to get you out of here. We're already over. Luckily, I know. It's how it goes. Yeah, you just happen to be too interesting to get out of here. No, it's me too. Oh. I'm. You had me at the the space 3D printing company. I, I, <laughs> if I could spend the next 45 minutes talking about that, that would be great. True. We'll, we'll kick it. We'll kick it in All Florida right. soon. We'll go to Miami or something. Okay. Great. Rec- advice that's, that you hear regularly that is not good. 30, there's got to be two sentences. I know. Of- I know. It's got to be fast. Do your own PR. Bad advice. Don't spend money on PR, meaning bad advice. Okay. In the last year, what new belief behavior habit has improved your life the most? Going to sleep early. Facts. Advice for someone starting a company? Find a big wave, build a big team, build a great team. Who do you want to hear on this podcast? Nick King from Vent, Vent vent.co. Tell us one thing about that person and let's make it happen. Nick is an incredible founder, capital efficient hustler. He found a big wave. He turns wine into valuable wine, that is, into fractional assets that you can invest in. So think about <laughs> here for one. Okay, actually, let's make that happen because now we're going to get every relevant fractional. We're going to get every relevant fractional investment platform. Do it. I'll be the plug. I know, I know a lot of them. So me or Kenny, hit me or Kenny for the plug. True. I mean, we love you both, so easy. All right, man, that is enough. We've already done the, what do you want to ask the listeners? Yes. So man, look, I thank you from the bottom of my heart for doing this. I cannot wait to get my 5X points or like fractional tokens back <laughs> when I start to invest and stay at these properties. And I'm excited for the Confluence community to, to start deploying their capital. Thank you. Thank Generally, you so much. VC's way too, way too risky and we need to diversify. Yeah, right. 100%. Yeah. No, thank you so much for having me. You know, definitely an honor to be on the podcast and i um, excited to speak again. Huge thanks again to Corey for coming on this week. We hope that each of you are able to pick up something valuable from this talk. If you're looking to get in touch with Corey, you can follow his social info in the description below. Or you can follow the website at here.co. For next steps, if each of you have not submitted your info to become a member yet, you can do that through our website at www.confluence.bc. And also, if you want to become a subscriber to the newsletter, we offer a ton of free resources in there each and every week meant to help you become better at your individual roles. You can subscribe there at www.confluence.substack.com. Hope that helps. Hope to hear from you all soon.